Happy New Year, everyone. Good morning. Glad you've all come in from the cold and that you got through the vaunted security of the building and that you're here to hear something very interesting. Uh, I was thinking this morning that today's discussion is uh, what the Wilson Center does best. We are steeped in scholarship and history and we're able to look forward and at the same time as we look back. And looking back on the Asian uh, financial crisis and seeing what lessons we've learned or not learned and looking forward to the possibility that uh, Asia either financially or uh, if, you, if you talk to Abe Denmark, possibly militarily could become more dangerous uh, is something you know, that may come up in discussion too. So um, several points. Uh, number one, Abe Denmark, as all of you know, is the new director of our Asia program. He's not that new anymore, but he's newish, and we're very grateful that he's here. Where is Abe Denmark? Oh, he's in the middle, and uh, sitting next to Shihoko Goto, our enormously capable expert on Japan and parts of the region. At any rate, welcome to Abe, and hi, Shihoko, and I'm really proud of the people who direct our programs. Secondly, um, uh, Meg Lunzinger, came to us because uh, my dear friend Christine Lagarde called one day and she said, the most talented person is leaving the IMF. She has to come to the Wilson Center. So she came to the Wilson Center for six months, which has become two years. A couple years now. Yes, well that's exactly what we wanted. And uh, Christine Lagarde looks over us. I was mentioning to Meg that um, yesterday, um, for better or worse, I was on the Fareed Zakaria show and the first text in was from my uh, sir, Christine, uh, just wonderful woman, a wonderful asset to uh, the Washington international community. Segue to Larry uh, Summers. I, I was trying to remember when we met Larry. I have no idea, but it was a long time ago. And Larry went on to, or was in the middle of, and still is in the middle of an enormously distinguished career. In, in various parts of uh, life, uh, including the tennis circuit. You didn't know that, did you? Uh, the Treasury Department, uh, president of Harvard, uh, distinguished professor at Harvard, and sage. Who knew that a kid named Larry would become a sage? But he is a sage, and he knows a ton about the issue uh, we're about to discuss. So, uh, you know, as the now seven years in, president and CEO of the Wilson Center, who, as I put it, escaped from the asylum and, but remains uh, a recovering politician. This is the kind of conversation you come here for. And this conversation will be substantive and interesting and show uh, the best of the Wilson Center, but also the enormous talent of our, uh, both our, our, our interviewer and our interviewee. So. Welcome, Larry. He tells me this is his first visit to the Wilson Center. That is not possible. That has got to be fake news. Um, but you're here now, and uh, Meg, uh, we're delighted that your six months turned into two years plus. Uh, please welcome Meg Lunziger, who will do more introductions, and then we'll hear from Larry. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm sitting in the front row so I can really learn something. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jane. That was a very uh, kind introduction, and we are very pleased to have uh, Professor Summers Larry here with us today. And as I look out here in the audience, what I can see through the lights is uh, many people who were uh, deeply involved in the crisis in, in one way or another, former ambassadors and others. So there's a lot of history here as well, and I think what we can have is a good discussion of uh, what happened at the time and what's happened since then and are we well prepared for what might meet us in the future? That, of course, is going to be very hard to anticipate, much as uh, many of us try and do that. But let me just start uh, uh, briefly, Larry. I mean, when the Asia crisis erupted, it was really in Thailand that sort of sparked it when they devalued their currency, the baht, in the summer of 1997, and this continued into 1998 and beyond when you were uh, at the uh, Treasury Secretary and market confidence disappeared, currencies came under pressure, and uh, 
all the economies in Asia and then globally felt the impact of this crisis. Can you tell us briefly what you recall really were the major reasons that this crisis occurred and why it, uh, why it spread across countries? And, and at the time, were you worried about how it might impact the U.S. economy as well? Let me just first say, Meg, how uh, glad I am to be uh, here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, Jane and I have been uh, friends <laughs> for a long time, since the early mid-1990s. Uh, I've learned a lot about security issues and about politics uh, from my interaction uh, with uh, Jane. I was also a good friend of her late husband, uh, uh, Sidney. And uh, one of the joys of being a political appointee at the Treasury Department, uh, Meg, is having the opportunity to work with civil servants uh, like uh, yourself, whether it was particularly on uh, Asian issues and on a range of uh, emerging market issues in ways that are too frequently, too infrequently recognize uh, the civil service and the people who staff the Treasury Department are Thank a you. huge national resource Thank and you. none were more capable or more dedicated or did more for our country uh, than uh, you did. You have had a career very much to be uh, proud of. And Jane, let me uh, second Christine Lagarde's view that uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center is very lucky to have Meg Lynn Sagus um, in, uh, in its midst. Um, the, Asian, uh, the Asian crisis, it was a, it didn't have to happen. It was a crisis of complacency and uh, vulnerability, um, and in some ways of uh, hubris. Countries chose to pursue fixed exchange rates. Those fixed exchange rates created an illusory stability they interpreted that stability as a sign of their virtue. They didn't commit themselves to doing what was necessary to maintain uh, that uh, stability. And uh, after a time, complacency uh, gave rise uh, to panic. Uh, Thailand had a fixed exchange rate it was invested, it invested a large amount of its government's credibility in that fixed exchange rate in non-transparent ways. It operated through the futures markets to hold that fixed exchange rate stable after the fundamentals supported its uh, stability. And then at a certain point when people realized that the cupboard was going to be bare, mm. there was a panic, and uh, the currency came under uh, savage uh, attack with uh, substantial economic disruption uh, to uh, Thailand. Um, when people see a big structural problem in one house in a neighborhood, it's natural to ask whether there are similar problems uh, in others, and uh, people found uh, similarities between the Thai situation, the Indonesian situation, mm -hmm. the Malaysian situation, and ultimately and most seriously, uh, the Korean uh, yeah, situation. Yeah. And so you had a cascading lack of uh, confidence that set off a bank run uh, psychology that was uh, very difficult uh, to contain and could be contained uh, only at quite substantial uh, cost. And so the situation was, I think, to that point uh, as alarming as anything we had seen um, in the global 
uh, financial environment in uh, perhaps the post-war period. Uh, it didn't involve the same kind of risk, concentrated risks to major financial institutions that the Latin American debt crisis mm -hmm. had involved, but it did uh, involve much faster acting and more virulent um, damage to uh, the economies in question. Of course, while it seemed enormous at the time, uh, in terms of its consequences for the American economy, it was really very small beer compared to what happened when financial crisis came to our shores in uh, 2007 and with particular force in 2008. Uh, absolutely. And I remember at the time uh, when you, you were at Treasury, I was at Treasury back then as well, and the effort was to put together a multifaceted response to try and prevent the contagion from spreading any further and to help these countries. You know, it helped them reach that bottom, hit that bottom, and then, and then recover. Uh, I, I was doing one part of it, working on one part of it, doing trade and investment and the, the trade finance side, but just what, what did you see as the major elements that helped us put together, that were the most important to getting that recovery going, calming markets, getting the recovery going, and uh, helping the countries return to normality? The basic diagnosis we had was that you had a somewhat unsound bank that was experiencing a massive run. And that was the diagnosis in each of the major countries. And therefore, you had to do two things. You had to make the bank sounder in a fundamental sense, but that wasn't going to be enough given the run psychology that was on. And so, the basic strategy was a strategy of making available a large amount of uh, resources uh, that meant that people didn't have to rush to the door for fear that if they didn't take their money out today, it wouldn't be there tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that was the central role of uh, the IMF and the central role of the new arrangement uh, to uh, borrow, while at the same time imposing uh, conditions and engaging in persuasion to try to get the countries to pursue policies that would involve uh, sounder fundamentals. If the problem your country is having is that uh, no one wants to hold your bonds, you probably have to reduce their price, which means uh, raising interest rates, and that was an important element in it. If the problem your country is having is that much more capital is leaving than is coming, you probably have to be prepared to put assets, to sell assets that you were not previously uh, prepared, that you were not previously prepared to sell. If there's a lack of confidence in your country's financial institutions, you probably need to be prepared to establish a framework that lets the major liabilities of those financial institutions um, be, pro uh, be protected. Um, and so the core, of the, the core of the strategy was containing the bank run while at this, by providing funding, while at the same time recognizing that you had to do something about the set of underlying uh, fundamentals. Right, so um, when you talk about the liabilities of the banks, you're talking about the deposits, so that the deposits would stay in the bank and, and not all rush. Well, or I'm, the using the yeah. I'm using a bank as an analogy as for, for the country. country right. That you but have a country with a large of, number yeah. of short-term liabilities, yeah. If people are not willing to roll over those liabilities right, then or if people who are holding local currency assets 
decide they can no longer trust the local currency. Currency, then they walk then, away. Then they walk away, exactly. And the one thing I remember that, you know, putting together the whole response was, you know, the New York Fed was part of encouraging uh, the U.S. Uh, banks to maintain their lines of credit that would allow trade to continue because as soon as the rush happened, all the institutions wanted to just close off all those, you know, constantly rolling over lines of credit that finance trade and other short-term transactions. So it was a multifaceted response that also involved um, the U.S. government trying to get some funding out of Congress. And I remember in particular it was to bolster the Export-Import Bank so that it, too, could provide cover for short-term trade to keep that going. And I remember that facility worked pretty well in Korea, that it turned over several times, uh, again, kept those markets functioning, which was one of the more direct impacts on the, on the U.S. So that was very helpful in terms of stopping that run on uh, Korea and on some of the, not less successful in uh, some of the other countries. I think that's right. It's a very delicate uh, business. Um, on the one hand, you want to concert the banks because any, all banks will be better off if they all roll over their funding and a catastrophe is avoided. But any one bank is better off <laughs> withdrawing it. its yeah. money, yeah. so you want to concert the banks. On the other hand, we are a free society and we're not a society where we call banks and tell them what they have to do with their uh, them. with uh, their money. And there's the risk that when you call them and you tell them that, they conclude the situation must be even worse than they thought before and accelerate uh, their moves uh, to exit. So <laughs> it was a, particularly in the case of Korea where the problem was most serious, it was quite a delicate operation of um, basically saying to the banks that the continued flow of IMF money was contingent upon their reaching an agreement um, among themselves that uh, would um, facilitate the rolling over, uh, the rolling over of uh, funds. And there were some in the private sector who displayed really quite substantial statesmanship in leading to private sector collaboration that helped to resolve the crisis. So they were all better off in the end then by- And in the end, they yeah. were, in the end, as it yeah. turned out on this occasion, they were all better off, yeah. Yeah, so it, it did work, but it, it is very hard to do, as I saw in subsequent efforts, similar efforts over the years. But uh, this reminds me of one of the things when uh, you know, we were talking with Congress about the crisis, trying to get some funding going. And one of the, the biggest concerns was exchange rates. And you remember the Korean won was depreciating quite a bit. Others, uh, you know, the Thai bot had started it. Uh, and it was very difficult to make the case in Congress, I remember, to say that we need to provide support for these countries, whether it was the new arrangements to borrow through the IMF or bilaterally through Export-Import Bank or something else, when they were saying, but, but, but these countries are letting their currencies collapse and it's going to hurt U.S. trade. I mean, I remember you, your predecessors, making the argument, well, if we don't help them, it's going to be much, much worse, and so we need to step in now to put a floor. How, how do we manage to persuade our own institutions, our own Congress, that what we're trying to do is to help countries improve the management of their exchange rate. How do we, how do we handle that delicate process of, you know, when countries need to adjust their exchange rate to some extent, but on the other hand, you know, what needed, I mean, control it look, some. The stark fact was that without support, the exchange rates would have fallen much further. And that our effort was an effort to prevent ruinous devaluation associated with uh, capital flight. And so we were in the situation of arguing what was very much in uh, the U.S. commercial uh, interest as well as in uh, the broad systemic interest. Now, 
you know, how, what was the right uh, level of pursuit of our commercial interest. Uh, I would say, looking back on it from the perspective of 20 years, there was a bit of conditionality that crept into the IMF and World Bank support for some of these countries that was less motivated by a theory of what was best for these countries than by particular commercial concerns of American companies right. who had substantial political leverage over Congress and Congress's ability to provide support. And I thought it was not a proud day in American history when we were using the leverage associated with the financial crisis to wedge open some market to be able to sell a little more beef for a few more semi, uh, semiconductors. But, you know, frankly, those sins are as nothing compared to the current national security strategy of the United States, which largely abandons the goal of international community, uh, largely abandons the things Woodrow Wilson uh, spoke about uh, literally one century uh, ago. I think it was literally um, a century, uh, a, I think it was literally a century ago today, uh, January 8th, 1918, when uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, spoke to the Congress about uh, why we were fighting uh, World War I and talked about an open and convergent uh, global economy of democracies and that it was to achieve such a thing that we were fighting uh, the First World War. And there's always been a balance in U.S. economic diplomacy between those kinds of systemic values, which I believe ultimately create a world in which uh, we are more likely to prosper, and the pursuit of narrower commercial, uh, narrower commercial uh, interests. There's always been those uh, tensions, and those tensions were very much there right. as we dealt with the Asian financial crisis. But we have not seen in the hundred years since Woodrow Wilson gave that speech, with the possible exception of a few moments between 1929 and 1932, when the Depression was becoming great, uh, the kind of narrow-mindedness in approach uh, to the global economy that comes with uh, the denial of global community as an even even as uh, an aspiration uh, that we're seeing at present, and it shows in uh, what I think is over time uh, a hugely serious threat to the institutional undergirding of the international system from the approaches, at least rhetorically so far, that uh, the administration has uh, taken. It comes uh, from what looks too much like a bipartisan renunciation of the aspiration to collective reduction in trade barriers, something that I think is very, very foolish for the United States, given that we have already removed most of our trade barriers. It's not that when the, it's not that the 11 countries that are going to go ahead with the TPP are going to have significantly less access to the American market than they would have if there had been the TPP. Right, right, yeah. The big difference is that we're going to have much less access uh, to, uh, their, uh, to their market. And it's there in uh, the willingness to embrace a 
system based on um, bilateral bargaining rather than uh, collective and systemic uh, values. And so I have regrets about failures that we were able to take to in those years to undertake uh, more support for systemic uh, values, our inability to support and participate because of an inability to move it through the Congress, an initial level of support uh, for uh, Thailand a, uh, when there was an international effort to stand behind uh, Thailand, a, uh, the kind of commercial uh, action uh, that I referenced, but it's a very different uh, thing uh, that uh, we're seeing that we're seeing today, and I think it's potentially very costly, and it will be very very costly if uh, another emerging market crisis is to come. Well. Uh that's what we're trying to do here at the Wilson Center, which is to keep this open perspective on all our relationships around the world, whether it's the political relationships or the economic relationships. And so we've had this theme here, and this, I've worked closely with the Asia group. We've spent a lot of time talking about TPP and, and bringing in the services aspect, too, how important access uh, across the board for the U.S. economy, not just manufactured goods, is important. So. Um, <coughs> You know, we'll have to see what the future will bring in terms of uh, understanding what we're missing out on and if that can be recovered. And if it can, hopefully the U.S. can make up some lost time. But, but I think many of us uh, are disappointed that uh, we won't be part of what's going ahead. But that's what brings me back to one of my questions is, you know, with the U.S. seeming, you know, maybe it is viewed as withdrawing a bit, but... Does that mean then there's going to be a new model of um, sort of economic policy adjustment? And we'll come back a bit to the financing side. But on the economic policy adjustment, is it going to be different if the U.S. isn't there sort of pr uh, pushing and supporting the IMF and sort of the traditional, whether in the Asia crisis it was a little too severe or not? But are we going to have a new model of how, you know, new financing arrangements are going to be pushing economic reforms in Asia, do you think? I think it's, I don't think it's easy, to, I don't think it's easy to know what we're going to have. I think that there's a very good chance that when the geopolitical story of this moment is written, it will be that uh, the United States voluntarily created a vacuum and that China filled that vacuum. And I think China will, Chinese support will come with conditionality, but that conditionality will be less based on economic theories of what's important for the countries to succeed and more based on China's broad nationalist interest. Nationalist interest in influence, nationalist interest in supply lines of uh, various, uh, of ver of, uh, various kinds, and nationalist interest in uh, the projection of uh, power. So I think that the reduction in financial support that's likely to uh, come, that vacuum will get filled, but it will get filled with support that um, will come with pressures that it seems to me are not in our national interest. I always thought that working through the World Bank and IMF were tremendously effective tools for the United States because for every dollar we put in, other countries put in five or six dollars. Exactly. Exactly. And what was done was very substantially what we wanted done, 
and some of what needed to be done was tough love and it was better for us not to have to take responsibility for the tough part of uh, the right, uh, right. tough love. So I always thought these institutions were hugely effective drivers of our interest, though if they came to be seen as 100% our creatures, we would lose some substantial part of uh, the benefit. But if we do what we did during the Obama administration and take six years <laughs> yes. to get the IMF mm -hmm. its uh, funding increase, right. if we do what we're in the midst of doing, which is basically keeping the World Bank at stasis in a growing uh, yeah. global economy by denying it the possibility of a capital increase, if we decline to participate in um, the Chinese Development Bank um, and we attempt, I mean, it was, I think, a, I think it was the nadir of post-war Asian-U.S. economic diplomacy, um, our handling of the AIIB. First, there was every reason why we should have been prepared to participate. We wanted things to be done our way. We wanted to be in cooperation uh, with uh, other countries. We wanted to be a presence. First, there was every yeah. reason to want to participate. The second is, is second point is that it's application of power 101. Don't publicly get caught pursuing objectives hard that you can't achieve. And so we attempted to stop the existence of the bank yeah, and we failed. And third, we failed about as ignominiously as one can fail because the people who led the charge into the AIIB against our requests were our longest standing ally, right. the British. Right. And so as a demonstration of fecklessness in Asia, it is hard to imagine how we could have done better. <laughs> I mean, I and um, so I think this stuff has um, pretty serious, has pretty serious consequences, not in a day or a month or a, or a year, but uh, over, uh, over time um, when one turns inwards, turns uh, selfish, um, others are prepared uh, to fill that space in ways that uh, serve uh, their objectives. And so it seems to me, and I guess this is an irony of it all, that the more alarmed one is in a long run sense about the threat that China poses the more the kind of policies that we are pursuing are a mistake. And so part of what is ironic to me is that uh, the current administration, which is more truculent in its, uh, in its orientation to China and more alarmed uh, by China than its predecessors is doing less of the things that are necessary to maintain our presence as a counterweight than those who are less alarmed about uh, China. So I find it very hard to understand the strategy within which 
strategic paradigm within which we're currently operating? You know, Larry, I think there is a lot of confusion out there. And when I think of, and having been at the IMF for so many years and worked closely with my Chinese counterpart and keeping in touch with them since I left the IMF, my sense is still that the Chinese want the IMF to be a successful institution. And they've recognized the same thing that you said, imposing tough love, that gets to be a real ugly bilateral relationship, right? Where one country's telling another, you must do X, Y, Z, or we won't give you, you know, your billion dollars. Much better to have the IMF do it through a collective, all the countries. So my sense is, is the Chinese are still very much vested in the IMF and recognize the benefits of having the IMF impose conditionality. And one reason I say this is because the Chinese have always been very focused on supporting strong economic programs at the IMF and supporting the institution as a whole, where admittedly, they don't have a controlling position, a share in it. You know, they're up to some 6% now. I mean, that'll be growing if there's ever a future quota increase. But, um, you know, they're still a very important member. Many countries are very important members. But um, I haven't seen them walk away from those international institutions as a vehicle for international cooperation. With that said, I recognize that the Belt and Road Initiative has its own set of relationships with the countries and conditionality, and, and we don't know what a lot of that is. The international community doesn't know what a lot of that you is. You might be right. Um, you, might, you, might, you might well be right in what you're saying. I, it seems to me that if your view was that the world was changing, that everything was moving your way, that the big stuff that was really going to determine the broad contours of the economy, a uh, global economy over the next 25 years was going to be your set of initiatives around Belt and Road. If that's what you thought, what would you do about the IMF and uh, the World Bank? It seems to me what you would do is be a politely good citizen while going about your business. Okay. Uh, going about your business elsewhere. And so why send up warning flags? Uh, why, create, uh, why, why create excessive uh, turbulence? I mean, one of the important lessons that I think skilled managers and leaders uh, uh, learn is that it's usually easier to create a new thing than it is to change an old thing. And so rather than go to war over how outrageous it is that they only have a 6% share and that the, their values aren't reflected enough and all of that, why wouldn't the right strategy for them uh, be um, polite, not hugely engaged, uh, participation with the activities of the IMF while there's heavy energy uh, elsewhere? Well, what, a lot of what's going on in the Belt and Road is not foreign aid. The Chinese are very clear about that. It's investment and it's loans, and that means the Chinese entities expect to be paid back. And we know in a lot of these countries, they're not going to be able to pay it back that even that wonderful infrastructure improvement is not going to generate the kind of higher government revenues that are going to allow these countries to meet these payments. And then the countries are going to stop paying, and we're back to where we were. And that's why I think, in the end, China, at least those parts of the Chinese government that understand how these international relationships work, the international institutions, are going to realize they will need them, the IMF, World Bank, and others, to help put that back together. Now, with that said, I am a little worried about some of the, the debt deals that are going forward without bringing in the IMF. I mean, we've seen this with China and, and Russia and their dealings with uh, Venezuela going on their own. But um, 
it's to me, I just don't quite see. I don't see. think the Chinese are going to be the dominant financiers of large swaths of territory and when trouble comes, submit themselves to the traditions of the Paris Club. Well, you I do have a point there. Is, yes. I think that is to wish, uh, but is not something uh, to uh, – not. Uh, not something uh, to be uh, to be uh, to be expected. I think there'll be a lot of lip service to the traditions of the past. But how are they going to get repaid then? If the countries can't pay the you know the budget, I think is they run have dry? a variety of kinds of leverage over uh, the countries. I think that in some cases, I think more of their loans are secured with some kind, kind of, of hard assets than is uh, the case with our human development, with the human development loans that we tend uh, to be uh, more, that we, that we tend to be more enthusiastic uh, about. And by the way, I don't think that it's going to happen that, I mean, I think Chinese have this figured about right. I don't think it's going to happen that large amounts of IMF and World Bank money are going to go into countries so that the Chinese government can take large amounts of money. Yeah, out. the rest of us won't like that. The rest <laughs> of us we'll aren't going to permit that. Yeah. So we'll I think you're yeah. seeing yeah. more of an alternative path of uh, financial support uh, than a complementary path. And I think it's something that will uh, play out uh, Will, will play out over time. Well, it will be interesting to see how it plays out because the Chiang Mai Initiative, which is this uh, arrangement Asian countries have to provide short-term financing, mainly through their central banks, these swap arrangements, um, it's over a couple hundred billion dollars, so it can be pretty helpful to a country drawing on it. But in this agreement, a country might be able to get an initial six-month amount of you know, some portion of it. And after that, it says, you must go to the IMF and get a program before we'll disperse any more. And that's the kind of ready financing that can help with a budget that's in trouble. So, you know, how are the Chinese, are the Chinese going to be willing to be flexible, for instance, on Chiang Mai and let more money go out? If they're supporting a government that can't really finance itself, we're going to be back where we were in, you know, 1997, 98, and it still won't work, and then the Chinese will be out. So I'm just not sure how far they're willing to go. Now, this is all going to unfold over the years. We won't know for a long time how tough it's going to be. But um, I think you've put out a very clear warning to the US, to all the Western countries that also are involved in many of these countries, whether it's through trade, investment, foreign aid, lending, uh, that you know there's maybe competing systems going on. Uh, when I was in China recently, just right after the Party Congress, I was trying to find out what is the, you know, what is Xi Jinping thought on these many different areas. And even though the message from our Chinese counterparts in various meetings was, well, we're going to do things the Chinese way, it was never clear what would be different and how they would use the international institutions or bilateral relations, how they would do it differently. And I don't know what it'll take over time for that to become apparent, because obviously President Xi can't opine and can't tell every one of his bureaucrats how to do their particular job. So I think it will be a tough time ahead in terms of how we sort this out in the United States and other countries, but also, in fact, how the Chinese are going to sort it out, because you're going to have enough mainstream officials in China who understand how these systems work and the benefit to China of keeping these systems working versus blowing it up uh, and completely going your own way. But from what you've said, you're worried that the United States is completely going its own way. So we'll have to see uh, see how this vacuums unfolds. Gets, I think vacuums get filled. And we seem to me to be uh, creating a vacuum in the uh, economic, in the broad, uh, economic diplomacy uh, area. There hasn't been a moment when there has been so little American commitment to collaborative enterprise uh, 
no, in the economic and financial area, and I can't believe that that vacuum uh, will uh, will not get filled. And at least uh, my sense is um, that uh, in emerging powerful countries, they don't think in terms of our institutional architecture no. <laughs> in uh, yeah. the way uh, in the way that uh, in the way in the way that we do. I think we're long past the day of uh, responsible stakeholder as a plausible strategic concept uh, for what we want to see China what we want to see China become? Well, if, if this is your view, and let's say if, if the countries themselves are aware of this, those the recipients, and may be concerned about the reliability of the future you know, rolling over, however China might continue to deal with the problem, do you think there's going to be more of uh, self-insurance by countries in terms of protecting their financial sectors, their uh, systems, whether it's through capital controls, limiting inflows and outflows, or going back to building up very large foreign exchange reserves. Well, I think if you look, there's people have built up levels of reserves that would have seemed inconceivable uh, 20 years ago. So I think it's in a sense already happening. In a sense, it's, uh, it's, alre it's already happening um, because I think people are very – uncertain of what kind of support they'll receive. I think they were already, before you had the various extra uncertainties that have been added, um, the uh, whatever defenses that I might offer, and I, and I would offer defenses and I would believe them, that the programs offered by the IMF were broadly the right economic strategy for bringing about as rapid a recovery and return to prosperity as possible. And I would read the subsequent 20-year history of Asia as being broadly corroborative of the approaches the IMF took. Whatever the merits of those arguments, I don't think they find much favor in Asia. And so I think there has been a desire to decouple uh, from dependence on the international system for a long time. And I think all that's happening now can only operate to uh, reinfor re reinforce that with the additional feature that um, I think in very profound ways the commitment of the U.S. government is now a thing to be treated less seriously yeah, that's part of my than program. it okay. used to be. It used to be you might not like what the U.S. government said. You might not like what the policy of the U.S. government was. But if the U.S. government said that this was its policy, you could reasonably suppose that it would be. But the magnitude of the shock that, to the system that this represents <coughs> I think we'll call that into we'll call that into question. Well, one thing that's always been difficult is when countries self-insure and accumulate foreign exchange reserves. Generally, it's in you know, most of it's in dollars, and and then it's put back in the U.S. You know, short-term securities. Um, but to do that, that means they need to frequently you know run a current account surplus with the United States. So we run current account deficits year after year after year in the United States. How much is that a problem for the U.S.? And is there anything the U.S. can really do about that? I mean, both candidates in uh, the election, you know, worried about uh, exchange rate manipulation, currency manipulation. Uh, yet, yeah, but what what can the U.S. really do about that? If countries feel they need to self-insure and are going to accumulate dollar-denominated mostly, there's some in other currencies too, reserves. Uh, what can the U.S. do about that? Should we care? Maybe we shouldn't care. Insofar as we care, the most important thing we can do is improve our fiscal position 
during the moments when our economy is strong so that we have a higher level of domestic savings and that more of our domestic investment can be financed domestically and therefore we're less dependent on foreign capital because if we don't need foreign capital inflows, the other side of a foreign capital inflow is importing more than we export. So insofar as it is a major problem, the solution is largely made through increasing <laughs> domestic savings, and the most potent and reliable way to increase domestic savings is to address uh, our fiscal posture. Right. So from that point of view, a large tax cut uh, at a moment of 4.1% unemployment uh, was misguided. That said, if you ask me, uh, is the at the current level of U.S. trade and current account deficits, is the accumulation of international debt our largest problem or no. one of our largest <laughs> problems? It would not be um, a major concern. And I think that it's important to recognize that whatever may have been true four or five years ago, that uh, the Chinese challenge in recent years has been to prevent the excessive depreciation right. of its right. currency. Right rather than to limit, for commercial reasons, the appreciation of its currency. Yeah, that was uh, really interesting. I mean, in all my years at the IMF, I, I, countries, the other directors, didn't really complain about, you know, U.S. current account deficits, the U.S. position. I mean, they might scold the U.S. on fiscal at one time or another, but basically they liked the fact that the U.S. was still, you know, very strong on the import side, helping their economies. So uh, e even in the, some of the depths of the crisis where there was a lot of uh, criticism of the United States, every once in a while I'd go to a board meeting and I'd find some of my colleagues doing as good a defense of what the United States was doing as, as I was because they wanted to make sure that the message was the U.S. was recovering, would be stronger, would be, uh, would be uh, maintaining its uh, position internationally. So, um, so we're in a little bit of a fix in terms of how we, how we go forward on this. As I said earlier, we'll try and keep our, our, our message uh, in terms of how interlinked the U.S. economy is with the, with the rest of the world. Um, in, in terms of how we, go, how we go forward and what might be the biggest problem, I mean, Asia recovered really pretty well. I mean, it was very painful at the time. But we saw, you know, remarkable turnaround. I mean, Korea uh, did very well. Some of the other countries took a bit longer. But even now, you know, Indonesia is doing much better. I mean, they're hosting the IMF World Bank annual meeting this year. So they've gotten over their long-term resentment of, uh, of the IMF and are a little bit more friendly. But at the same time, you know, none of these countries really seem to want to sign up for you know, an IMF uh, facility or, you know, the IMF tried to put out this idea to have a short-term swap arrangement through the IMF and, and just couldn't get enough support in the room. And I think part of it was countries didn't want to sign up. Maybe it was on the creditor side of it, too. Um, what, does this, what does this tell us about how, how we'll be able to manage how these countries, let's say, just amongst themselves, and what will be the role of Japan in terms of how they interact, you know, setting aside your concerns about, uh, about the U.S. Uh, seemingly or actually uh, withdrawing from engagement here? I, I don't, I can't answer that uh, question with high confidence. In general, I think uh, countries will desire to provide for more self-reliance mm. than they had before. I am skeptical, given the magnitude of long-standing historical resentments mm -hmm. about the depth and thickness of any institutional arrangements that will form uh, in mm -hmm. uh, Asia. In general, I am skeptical of contingent finance, which it seems to me usually will be there as long as it's not needed. <laughs> and 
I am <laughs> skeptical that, in fact, large amounts of money will ever be lent from one Asian central bank to another yeah, Asian I central agree. bank in any moment when there's a serious question as to whether it will be repaid. Mm -hmm. And if there's no question as to whether it will be repaid, there's no great need for the lending uh, to take place. So I think there's a little less there in these various yeah. swap arrangements uh, <laughs> than uh, meets, uh, meets the eye. I didn't think the Asian Monetary Fund idea in 1997 was a hugely plausible idea given the various weaknesses of the Japanese mm. uh, economy, given the various internal resentments uh, within Asia. And it seems to me after the last 20 years of Japanese economic difficulty, somewhat harder uh, to imagine uh, Japan taking uh, a lar taking a larger uh, a larger role, so it seems to me the risks are more again. I come keep coming back uh, to uh, China, to which it. has the lever of the size of its market, the lever mm -hmm. of very substantial expertise the lever of substantial diasporas uh, in uh, many countries uh, operating uh, to uh, fill, these fill, uh, fill these vacuums. Now, you know, China is um, not without its own very substantial challenges in maintaining economic growth and maintaining uh, political and social stability. Yeah, and yeah. so I think one needs to be cautious about overstating the strength of their position. But it does seem to me that um, if you're not a democratic leader, there are basically two forms of glue they can keep you. They can keep your population comfortable with you. One is you're delivering economic results on the ground, right. Right. and the other is that you and your population are bonded around your concerns about external threats. And it seems to me, if mm. uh, China's economic performance were to disappoint. Uh, that the pressure for nationalism um, would uh, only increase. And that's not a favorable outcome no, either. So it's not that these challenges would be resolved by um, a period of Chinese economic weakness, uh, very much right, the contrary. Right, right, absolutely. Well, where do you see uh, the biggest vulnerability to the global economy right now? Is there a particular country? I mean, you shared your concerns about the U.S., but think of what might spark another financial crisis. And the one thing we've learned about financial crises over the years is uh, we're not really very good at predicting what exactly might spark it, even if you can identify vulnerabilities. But what do you see? You know, there's been a whole constellation of reforms that the international community adopted over these uh, last 20 years. A lot of financial sector regulation improvements, uh, some financing windows, this sort of thing, to try and reduce all these vulnerabilities. Certainly more transparency in what central banks are doing, what governments are doing. So what do you see as sort of the biggest vulnerability that facing the global economy uh, in the next couple of years? What Maybe not what would spark a crisis, but what should we be worried about collectively? I guess I think the vulnerabilities are, one, uh, geopolitics. Um, you know, somebody here estimate. I, I ask someone here who's knowledgeable um, what the odds were that there would be some kind of attack on North Korea within the next year, and the answer I received was 50%. Uh, 
that's higher than I would have guessed, but I don't really know. But it's probably not too high by a factor of three. And so um, that, look at what's going on in uh, the, uh, the Middle East. I think you have to say that this is a moment of unusually high uh, geopolitical risk, which is not priced into markets to any appreciable degree. And therefore, markets are at risk of changing based on that geopolitical risk. The second, uh, the second change is we're moving from a phase of central bank easing to a phase of significantly more central bank tightening mm -hmm. of policy. And historically, it's tightening phases that tend to be difficult for yeah, more painful um, <laughs> emerging markets. And if a year from now, both the United States and Europe are in a meaningful uh, tightening yeah. phase, that comes with uh, the prospect of significant uh, financial uncertainty. And I think the third thing uh, to say is that in this world of what I've called secular stagnation and very low interest rates, you have a lot of people who aren't satisfied with the 1.5% they can get on treasury bills who therefore go and try yeah, to take right. risks of various right. kinds, engage in various yeah. kinds of carry trade. And so you, I don't think I would call financial markets bubbly right now, but they're not without froth um, <laughs> either. And so that would seem to me to be a risk factor um, a risk factor as well. And I think it's important to recognize that there's a kind of brittleness in the global economy caused by the fact that what usually happens when things go wrong is we lower interest rates by four or 500 basis points. Right. And we're not going to have room to lower interest rates by anything like four or 500 basis points next time around. Right. No, I think <laughs> Absolutely right. So the question is, when do market sentiments change, and and how do they change, and where does money go, where does money flee, and that's what's so difficult to predict. But I do want to give some time for uh, our participants here, and Jane, please, we'll start with you. And as I call on different people, please identify yourself and, and keep your questions brief. Yes, do we have mics here? No? Oh, here's one. Okay. Yeah, it's coming. This testing. Okay. Well, fascinating discussion and a testament to why Meg is not leaving the Wilson Center anytime soon <laughs> and why Larry's coming back very soon. Um, so, so my question is about linkage. There's an old adage that if, if you're in a hole, stop digging. And it seems to me that the decision of the Obama administration not to join the Asian Investment Bank was a strategic mistake. And the decision of the Trump administration to toss overboard TPP was a strategic mistake. So we're in this hole where we have given China a big gift um, to, uh, or a big opportunity to fill a vacuum, as you said, Larry. So my question is, what is the linkage of these economic deficits we have, strategic deficits with Asia, to national security. You, you raised uh, Abe Denmark's prediction, which I hope is wrong, that there's a 50% chance of, of war with North Korea. Whatever the, the percentage is, do we have uh, Asia, support in Asia anymore? I mean, we were, Obama was pivoting to Asia uh, which caused some consternation in the Middle East and elsewhere. But that pivot, we m most of us thought, was increased economic arrangements with Asia. Now we don't have those. So in national security terms, and I realize you're an economist and you focus both of you more on, on that sphere, but what is the linkage between what I would call big strategic mistakes in Asia in the economic area and uh, whatever support we can we can rely on Asia for as we face huge security challenges in Asia. 
Look, I, I, I'm not able to speak with nuance about uh, the South, uh, the South China Sea, and I'm not able to speak with uh, nuance about uh, the precise uh, diplomatic uh, strategies for isolating or for isolating North Korea, but it's hard to believe that when you establish yourself as less reliable, less generous, and less, predi less predictable, and less committed to the normal civilities, that it does anything other than make people less, be less likely to support you when you feel a need, you feel a need for their support. And it seems to me that uh, we are doing all of those, that we are doing all of those things um, in a, uh, in, a uh, in a substantial way without, it seems to me, having a strategic concept vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China. I mean, if, you know, if we had a, we might have a concept, which is we were moving more towards condominium, or we might, with China, or we might have a concept, which is that the biggest national security threat to us is overextension, and so we're going to reduce our extension and North America is okay. I don't think I would much like either of those strategic concepts, but I would understand them as strategic concepts. I'm, if we have a strategic concept in our relationship with China, observing the two summits we've had between uh, Trump and Xi and what came, uh, what came out of them, I'm not able to discern uh, what that what that strategic concept uh, is, and it just seems to uh, it just seems to me that that has got to be uh, corrosive of trust in us, with uh, ultimate consequences for national security. And as I talk to many counterparts, still they still they desperately want the U.S. to be involved. They want to see U.S. leadership. They want to work with the United States. So I, it, it is very frustrating, very upsetting to see that you know we're walking away from that when through a bit of collaboration you can actually uh, achieve some things. But let me turn to some of the others uh, in the middle here and then up front. Yeah, is that Robert? Yes. Yes. Uh, Robert Daly, I direct the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States here. It seems to me we had two conversations. We started out speaking about the history, a look back at the Asian financial crisis, and then pretty quickly we moved to contemporary China in particular, and, th and that linkage in itself I think is telling. And I wondered if I could, and it was an extremely valuable conversation. I strongly second all of your analysis, very useful. But could I ask you to draw a connection between the two conversations? I know you spend a lot of time with Chinese leaders. What lessons did China draw from the Asian financial crisis? Were they the correct lessons? And how do they inform China's sense of its own mission and role in the region now, its, its leverage in the region now? Or have any lessons that they learned been overtaken by China's general sense of, of triumphalism and the success of its rise? Thank you. Good, it's, it's a good question to which I wish I could give an answer. I was more confident it was intelligent. Um, I, I think um, that China is in so different a place today that it was in 1997 that it doesn't see um, – it doesn't, it doesn't see uh, – huge uh, take huge takeaways uh, from it. I think the big lesson 
that it probably took from the Asian financial crisis and from the even more from the 2007-2008 financial crisis was that we weren't as smart as they might have thought we were. And I think that they might have supposed that, you know, we were the, that in the, that in the, in the world of Keynes and Friedman and Samuelson and whoever, that there lay great economic understanding that was the root uh, to prosperity. And I think given that our style of capitalism seems to have been prone to create as much of what they fear most as it has, and what they fear most in any setting is uncontrolled disorder, that they're just less confident that kind of we know what we're doing around all of this stuff. So I think what they've learned is maybe the IMF knows, maybe the IMF uh, doesn't know, and they're much more willing to indulge in their traditional practices, which for right or for better or for worse, have been associated with 30 years of the fastest growth the world has ever seen, then, <coughs> then, to, per, uh, then to pursue um, our ideas. And I think that's probably the biggest uh, takeaway uh, for, take away for them uh, from uh, the two financial crises. I think it also, I think there's also probably a lesson, which is sort of correlated with the lesson I already emphasized around do things gradually, don't throw, th don't throw things open, maintain, uh, Maintain substantial, uh, maintain substantial controls. Those are, I think, the takeaways. Those are what I would judge they've learned. Um, hi, Peter Samar, Capital Intelligence, Greater Central Asia. My question is to Sec uh, uh, Secretary Summers. Um, as the Chinese say, we live in interesting times. How do you ex explain this unnatural? It seems to be unnatural volatility, lack of volatility in our financial markets. We have all this stuff going on, but our markets don't seem to be moving anywhere. You know, and especially you see this in Chicago and America. We see this on equity market. The only volatility seems to be on the Bitcoin exchanges. Can you explain why we're not seeing this, and how sh and how much should we worry about it? I think in general, it's a lesson. This isn't new. It's a lesson of history that huge geopolitics is less associated with market moves than you would think. If I, showed you, if I showed you a graph of the US stock market daily and I didn't label the dates and I, except in a very broad way, and I said, tell me when the Cuban Missile Crisis was tell me when 9-11 was, tell me when Kennedy was shot, tell me when VJ Day happened, you'd have a hard time doing it. And so as a general matter, there, it's just a his, long-term historical observation that stuff that seems really pretty exciting to State Roy doesn't seem very exciting uh, to <laughs> markets. And there's bunches of stuff markets get excited about that doesn't seem that exciting to State Roy. Um, the, the two worlds are, are, in general, more disconnected and have been for a long time than one would expect. That's the first thing I'd say. Second, um, there's a systematic tendency when markets go up for them to become less volatile. And for some set of reasons, they've gone substantially up, and that would be associated with their being less volatile. Third, um, it has been, in the micro, a relatively placid period. That is, if you look at corporate earnings announcements mm -hmm. and you look at how, how often 
and by how much corporate profit announcements have surprised. The surprises this year have been unusually small. If you look at um, the dispersion of forecasts, you know, take the 95th percentile forecast of GDP growth for next year and the 5th percentile forecast of growth for next year, they are unusually tightly uh, compressed. So I think those are all elements uh, that go into the explanation um, for, why the, uh, for why this is. There's also a view that I would put a little less emphasis on, but that people who are sophisticated in markets would put a lot of emphasis on, that um, poli policy authorities are more committed to having stability than they used to be. And so if you have a Fed that who's, who's much more likely to cut interest rates if the stock market falls or to not raise interest rates if the stock market falls and will raise them much faster if the stock market starts to go up, that operates, come what may, to be stabilizing of the stock market. So I think those would all be elements in the story in answer to your question. Uh, yeah, in the back here, middle, thank you. Uh, very good morning to everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mike Gordon. Um, I'm here at the Wilson Center. Uh, two questions, one that goes back and one that goes forward. Um, from your time in living through the Asian financial crisis, I have um, I've read in various accounts of the time that uh, the uh, South Korean Ministry of Finance called up the Treasury at the 11th hour and said, oh, by the way, we're almost short on reserves, and in a few days we're out. Um, and I wanted to know if that's apocryphal or if that really happened and how you dealt with that. Um, and then looking forward, um, what are your thoughts on the inevitable rise in interest rates over the next uh, few years and that impact on um, the ability of especially emerging markets and the uh, extraordinarily high uh, debt ratios, debt to GDP ratios that have taken place over the past few years? Thank you. Um, Broadly, the uh, br broadly the impression that uh, they had um, deposited large amounts of their reserves in their banks, s and they were necessary for their bank's stability, so they weren't really there to meet other objectives, and that they had suppressed that fact, and that fact became clear only at a very late and desperate hour. That's based. That I would say is basically an accurate um, rent is, is basically an accurate uh, rendering of the s rendering of the story, and it you know it points out one of the great problems in dealing with financial crises, which is that um, usually the people who get into them have done fairly terrible things, but you can sort of either have confidence or you can have vengeance, but you can't really have both, and it's usually more important to have confidence. And so I always used to compare uh, the IMF's problem in dealing with troubled countries to a parent's problem in dealing with their troubled uh, adolescent child. Um, you know, their troubled, the parent says to the troubled adolescent, I'm not going to pay tuition next year if you don't start working and get decent grades. And really, I mean it. And the adolescent goes and gets even worse grades and starts having some disciplinary problems and says, by the way, Dad, I don't really want to go back to school next year anyway. And then what's Dad supposed to say? Well, okay, great. You're not going back to school. It's not a very good option for, doesn't feel like a very good option for dad. And there's a similar problem, which is it's much easier to lay out conditions and to say you won't get the money if you don't meet the conditions than it is after somebody's not met the conditions 
and they vow to do better next time when there's a new finance minister than to sort of carry through on, uh, on all of that. Look, I think the question is, the question about rising interest rates is how fast will they rise, how much this is all already priced into markets, and how much this is all sort of expected. And so far, it's been a very gingerly path to higher interest rates. Will it stay a very gingerly path to higher interest rates? I kind of suspect it will. If inflation lurches upwards, it might not. If the Fed does things that, from my point of view, would be serious mistakes, it might not. But I would say, in general, you know, if, if I had to say to non-financial people what the one thing they should keep in mind as they think about things in markets that they don't naturally keep in mind, it would be that markets don't respond to what happens. They ha respond to what surprises. And that what's already expected is largely baked into markets. And so if, if, if rising interest rates are a problem, it's not that rising interest rates are necessarily a problem. It's that interest rates that rise surprisingly rapidly would be a problem. And I'm not saying that couldn't happen, but the simple fact of an anticipated increase in interest rates, I think, is unlikely to be a wrenching problem. Maybe one more quick question, if uh, yes, here in the front. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jack Krapansky, unaffiliated. Um, what was going on in 95 and 96 that the IMF or Treasury or whoever should have been more alert to? I mean, did everything, was everything really fine then and it just 97 something was very different? Or was that just when uh, the straw broke the camel's back? You know, you just um, followed in the footsteps of the Queen of England. Uh, the Queen of England famously was at some ceremonial event uh, in 2008 or 2009. The Queen of England was brought into the company of some group of economists, and she said, like, how come nobody saw this coming? Isn't that, like, the purpose of you guys to see things like this coming? Yeah, right. <laughs> and how come uh, none of you did? And I guess I'd answer in two ways. One is it's the nature of markets that big jumps can't be predictable. Because if it could be predictable and lots of people could see it, they see that the market was going to crash, then they'd sell, and then the market would have already crashed. So there's a kind of deep logic that says that um, big moves in markets will never be readily predictable because anyone that was readily predictable will have already will have already happened. That's the first thing. You know, could what looking back, um, I think I touched or in answer to Meg's first question. I sort of gave my answer. It was a shortage of reserves excessively hocked in conjunction with an untenable commitment to a fixed exchange rate. And so, in general, I think fixed exchange rates are very risky, are very uh, risky business because they can make everything look good when uh, it isn't, uh, when, it, when it isn't actually good. You know, if you zip up your suitcase, if you zip up your, if you put too much stuff in your suitcase and you zip it up too tight and it all seems terrific and nobody can see any problem, your suitcase is more likely to rip. Uh, uh, rip suddenly in a big accident. And to kind of see it, you have to have sort of looked and seen how tightly packed the suitcase was. And that's a little bit like what fixed exchange rates were. So I would say fixed exchange rates with irresponsible accompanying policies um, and particularly non-transparent accompanying policies uh, 
that created the room for surprise would be what I'd emphasize. Well, um, we've run over here, and so uh, I want to thank you very much, Larry, for joining us here today. This has been a very interesting discussion, and I appreciate the questions uh, from our uh, audience here as well. So would everyone please join me in, in thanking uh, Larry Summers? Thank you.